out. People just sit down and, and um, be a great way to get to know you and know people in the church. If there's rain, we just hold it inside here. So you're invited to do that. Second sort of announcement is um, I will have the privilege this year of working with junior high. I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm out of town this Wednesday, but the 22nd, I start um, being part of the team that's uh, having ministry on Wednesday night to junior high, which means I'm not available for what was advertised as Pastor Kirk's Bible study. So it needs to be Pastor somebody else's Bible study. And uh, I'm looking for somebody to come to me and say, I want to lead that. So if you're willing to do that, let me know and we'll get the word out. Um, so that's an invitation. If you have a heart for teaching adults the Bible, would you, would you let me know? Um, let the, call the office or call me. Let me know and I, we can do that. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you do work in your word. And for those without it, you work in dreams. You, you approach us and seek us and present us the offer of the one who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The burden of faith is so much lighter than the burden of the law. And Father, for this we thank you that Jesus fulfilled the law and offers us grace. I pray that in this room and around the world, by the power of your spirit, there will be reception of the good news, receiving and believing hearts. May it be so here today, Lord. Someone has come here seeking. Someone has come here who does not know you as Savior, who has never surrendered, never understood. May today be the day they see clearly. They see a vision, Jesus, of who you really are. Lead us, Christ, by the power of your spirit. Overcome this preacher, use this word. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. We are in Genesis. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am to look at how God came to us so long ago and how this plan of salvation is a, is a long arced story that comes to fullness in the cross and we live now in that fullness we're titling this part as we talk about Joseph, what was meant for evil. His brothers meant him evil, but God was using it to save many lives. In fact, in Genesis 50, which is about nine chapters ahead, Joseph says this to his trembling, shaking, scared brothers. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, what's powerful about this is every one of us can identify with Joseph. We can identify with the brothers. I don't, I don't know if you watch the movie the, or the, the TV series The Office. How many of you? All of America, apparently, but not here, okay? Um, I, I watch The Office, and, and what's disturbing to me is I can identify with every character. You ever go through that? You have a little bit of Dwight in you, a little bit of the Mike the boss in you, a little bit of Jim, a little, a little bit of, you know, and it's, everybody's flaws are shown, and so are mine, and so are yours, hopefully, and you're, you're not embarrassed by that, but you do have to bring that to, to change, and in the life of Joseph and his brothers, we see it all. Now, let me recap what Joseph went through. At 17, wearing the cloak that his father made for him, that indicated that his father loved him best, which just infuriated his half-brothers from three other women, those brothers saw him coming. He was doing his father's business, and they saw him coming, and they said, here comes that dreamer. Let's throw him into a pit and die, and we'll take that coat, which is distinctively his, we'll pour lamb's blood on it and tell dad he's dead. That'll do it. But they realized, seeing some people in the distance, they could accomplish two things, get rid of him and make a little money. So they pull him up out of the pit and sell him to slave traders. He's off to Egypt for 20 pieces of silver. As you hear these things, think Joseph does, he's like, like Jesus. He's on his father's business. He's hated by his brothers, the very people he's about to save. Amen? He's sold for silver pieces. 
He's as good as dead in a pit. He's sold eventually to Potiphar, the Egyptian official, who buys him as a slave. But God is with Joseph, as God was with Jesus. Joseph was wise and trustworthy and blessed by God, not even by his own things, but God was pouring himself through Joseph because he had a plan. And all he managed for Potiphar was doing well. And he was elevated to number two in Potiphar's house. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but when God blesses you and comes through and you realize, wow, then what happens if it falls apart? Who were you counting on? What, right? It's a tricky moment. A lot of people turn away from the Lord. They don't let themselves be an instrument in God's hands for the good and the bad. So Potiphar, his wife was a problem. And she saw this young Joseph with all of this power, and maybe she saw the new guy or whatever, but she tempted Joseph. Again, Jesus was tempted. She tried to seduce him, and he refused each attempt. And as she grabbed him, the last time he fled, leaving behind his cloak. Angry, she accused Joseph of rape to Potiphar, and Potiphar threw him back in prison. Wait a minute, God, you had me, but what about this? We know from hindsight on this side of Easter, so to speak, that it's all part of the plan. But when you're on this side of Easter, it's hard to take, amen? It's hard to take when you lose your job, when something breaks apart, when you feel betrayed. It's hard to understand that God could be in it. But he is to the believer, he is. Miraculously, over time, the prison warden recognizes Joseph's ability and grants Joseph favor, makes him number two in the prison warden's house. It's actually a a prison in his house. And he gives all authority to Joseph. And so now he's elevated back up. And our story is going to happen in that setting. But I showed you last week this sort of heartbeat sign of life with the ups and the downs of life. And if you live old enough, it's going to end badly, folks. (laughs) You're going to hurt more than you do now. You're going to breathe less comfortably than you do now. I'm sorry to say it, but if you see life linearly along the time axis, good Lord, you'd turn into Hemingway. Amen? We know how that ended. I guess if you're over 70, we know how that ended. But no, no, we flip the axis because there is no time. And what to some looks like ending in misery to us is just a pathway of following the Lord. And Jesus, somewhere along the path, whether we die at 21 or 101, says, in my Father's house are many rooms. I will come and take you to be with myself. We're all going to stumble on the way. And death, or as I like to say, I'm going to fall into my spaghetti at some point. And at that point, all the promises. Christ comes and takes my spirit, though my body dies. That's what he said to Martha. And so I choose to see my life ups or downs as whatever it is, I'm in the Lord's hands. Now, some of the downs are my consequences. Some of the downs are brought on by sin. God didn't bring those things. He allowed them. Some of the consequences are brought on by the evil meant by other people. God didn't choose those things, but he allowed them. And he gave us a world in which we're free to choose him or not. And in such a world, people choose evil all the time. Amen? To love has to imply the ability to not love. People are mad at God for what happens by people who don't love him. And yet God sits there inviting us back to him. But I choose to see my life as a path with ups and downs, but all of it, I'm becoming more like Christ. And I guarantee you some of the best ways to become like Christ is through suffering. So if if we choose to see life in an eternal perspective, we're headed home. We're headed home. Remember that. Now, isn't this funny? This kind of, when you see it juxtapos- juxtaposed to that, that life map, this is the redemption map. God chooses through Abraham by Sarah, by Rebecca, through Isaac, and then Jacob, and through these 12 people who all need a Savior. These are horrible people, but it's going to end in Jesus Christ, physically. Spiritually, he's God. Physically, he's descended from this family that needs a savior. That's the plan all along. This family will go into captivity. Their their disobedience will cause suffering. But it ends in Jesus Christ, who has his arms open to the world. I'm begging you to get this picture. Amen? This is the gospel, and it starts in Genesis. Or let's see it. Let's flip the axis. It still ends in Jesus. 
I hope this is helpful. So what was meant for evil, God uses for good. Let's recap. Joseph was there in prison. The Lord was with him. Now remember that. In fact, we could stop there. You know I won't, but we could. That's all that matters. On this path of ups and downs, through time, on this side of eternity, in this universe we have time, beyond the universe, the Father's house, there is no time. So we're timeless. Our spirits, the light he put in us, which goes light speed, and at light speed is no time. We are timeless energy inside bodies that God will resurrect. He's going to do everything he promised. Joseph has to believe those promises, and so do you. And while Joseph was there in prison, God was with him. And while you and I are imprisoned in these bodies, God is with us. Amen? Emmanuel. Christmas. Well, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. He was made responsible for all that was done there. Now here's our new scripture. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. We don't know how, but it was enough to throw him in the prisoner's house. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. I don't know, maybe it was a bad meal. I mean, it'd be tough. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended him. That is a trusted prisoner. After they'd been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, were being held in prison, had a dream. The same night, same night, both had a dream. And each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, and this would seem senseless, useless, except that God's at work in it. They were dejected. So Joseph asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him, why do you look so sad today? Well, we both had dreams, they answered but there's no one to interpret them. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Interesting way to say it. Joseph is saying, God can tell us, tell me. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed and its clusters ripened with grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember I told you this. When this starts working out, remember me, and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of here. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. That sounds like a deal. Now, that's the cupbearer. Imagine if you're the baker and you hear that. You're like, all right, let me tell you my dream. So when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. Yeah. On my head were three baskets of bread, and the top basket were all kind of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Well, all right. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat your flesh. Oh, no. No, no, no. Let, uh, wait a minute. My dream was about... Uh, bah. <laughs> now, the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. And he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his feet, lifted them up. Stand up, gentlemen. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had said in his interpretation. Yikes. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Which is a is a an ugly little picture. And we've all been there. We've either been on Joseph's side of it or sometimes we've been the chief cupbearer. When we act with grace we're given and we don't forgive somebody else, we look like the cupbearer. 
Amen? My dad used to say it this way. You know, once, you know, it, it's sort of a, a, a boat rescue scenario, but once you get in the boat, you're all for pulling up the ladder and taking off, right? Not for hanging around and letting the other people still swim and find the ladder. So Pharaoh had a dream. And this is 41, and, and this will go just as quickly. But it's powerful stuff, and they go together. When two full years had passed, so, so Joseph is languishing two more years in prison. None of it deserved. And yet not, the timing is exactly God's timing. Why didn't the cupbearer, he could be bitter at the cupbearer, and yet God must have prevented this, because had the cupbearer remembered these dreams, Joseph wouldn't be around for this moment. Think of that. Some of the difficulty you're going through if you're walking with the Lord is you're waiting for God's appointment. Some of us get cancer. That's God's appointment. John Piper says that's your new pulpit. Whatever it is that's on us that we hand back to the Lord. To the disciples who couldn't feed 5,000, Jesus says, you feed them. And they said, we just have five loaves and two fish. Jesus says, give it to me. He blessed it. And there was more left over than they began with. Whatever you hand to Jesus, he will use for his purposes based on his axis, not ours. And the degree to which we're controlled by Christ is the degree to which we learn to adapt ourselves to Christ and see things his way. Hey, it's not going my way, but it might be God's way. Amen? That's hard, but that's what preaches in your life. People will see that. In fact, the greatest pulpit to share the gospel is difficult. One of the reasons the church in America is weak, it's prosperous. And we get lazy. I do. Don't you? It's not that things are bad. It's not that prosperity is bad. What axis are we using our prosperity for? Our comfort of the gospel. It's a challenge to everyone. And it's a personal challenge. I resent when the government tries to answer that question for me or for you. But I love it when we ask that question personally and make our dedication personal. So Pharaoh has a dream. He's standing by the Nile when out of the river there come seven cows, sleek and fat. They grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt came up out of the Nile and stood beside there on the riverbank. The cows that were ugly and gone ate the seven sleek fat. That's a dream. I mean, he might not have pizza for a few nights after a dream like that. So seven fat cows and then seven sleek ugly cows, or I mean uh, skinny ugly cows, and the ugly cows eat the fat cows. Yikes. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good. Single stock. After them, seven other grains of grain sprouted, thin and scorched. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the healthy Pharaoh woke up, it had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled, and so he sent for all his magicians and wise men. Pharaoh told him his dreams, but no one could interpret the dream for him. Pharaoh doesn't have a gospel. Pharaoh doesn't know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God wants to use Pharaoh, so he takes Joseph, who does, puts him through difficulty, to where when Pharaoh who God is going to use, calls on Joseph. Joseph is there. It meant difficulty for Joseph. He suffered just like our Savior suffered for me so that when I needed him, he was there. And he says, I should be like him so I should see my life as a gift to God, suffering or whatever he gives me. I'll live on God's axis. So Pharaoh can't get his dream interpreted. Who's near Pharaoh? His cupbearer right next to him. So the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. <laughs> Pharaoh was once angry with his servant, if you'll remember, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream. Each of us had a meaning. A young Hebrew was there with us, <clears throat> a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams. He interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream, and things turned out exactly as he interpreted. I was restored. The other man was impaled. That's an impressive testimony. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard that you can interpret such dreams, so let's see what you can do with it. I, I can't do it, Joseph said, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. My God, Yahweh, 
And Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. He tells him the story. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain. Again, the ugly after seven devour the good. No one can explain this to me. And so Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. The dream about the cows and the dream about the grain are the same dream. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. And why would God do that? Because this is how the nation of Israel is going to be formed. It's part of God's big plan that ends with this moment where you and I are here. Do you realize that? We're in this story. Isn't that amazing? This is happening so you and I can trust in Jesus Christ and live lives that are not desperate, nasty, brutish, and short. So he he interprets the dream. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. Seven good heads of grain are seven years. One and the same dream. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain. They are seven years of famine. Hey, man, it's seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming, but seven years of famine will follow. And all the abundance will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God. And God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners. So not only does he interpret the dream, but Joseph is given the plan. Here's what you should do about it, Pharaoh. Store grain for seven years. And take a fifth of the harvest during the seven years of abundance. Collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so the country may not be ruined by the famine. Oh, that we had such a leadership. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom there is the spirit of God. You see, this, this, this has earned, Joseph's suffering has given him a pulpit where he's ready in such that he's following the Lord. Had Joseph been in bitterness, none of this happens. And you and I are sunk. But he wasn't. The saving of many lives includes the saving of you and me. So the Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You will be in charge of my palace with all my people. They'll submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph, I deputize you. You are now not only number two in Potiphar's house, not only number two in the jail, you're number two in all of Egypt. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, you're in charge of the whole land. He dressed him in robes of fine linen. Isn't it funny how... The robes always play a role. It's the cloak that so infuriated his brothers. They stained it in the blood of the lamb and sent Joseph off. It's the cloak that he left behind in the woman's hand that was used against him. And now it's the cloak of Pharaoh that shows his authority. It was Jesus' cloak that they gambled over and and put on him and mocked him like, oh, you're the royal king. When in reality, God was doing it all. The cloak was just a representation. The chain around his neck. He had him ride in chariots, and this is an interesting people. So people shouted, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh without your word. No one will lift a hand. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name zaphnath paneah and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land. So Joseph marries, and Joseph has two kids. Joseph was 30 years old, so 13 years have passed from when his brothers sold him. He went out from Pharaoh's presence, traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in the seven years, stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much, they stopped keeping records. But they're going to need every bit of it because the world is going to be in famine. And that's what brings the rest of Joseph's family to Egypt. Before 
before the years of famine, two kids were born. Manasseh, which means forgetful. He forgot his troubles. And Ephraim, which means double blessed, twice fruitful. And it happened as he said it would happen. So that when all of Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And then Pharaoh told the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. This is why Joseph's family was loved at first. Historically, we don't know when this took place. I, I, I didn't have time to nail this down. I don't know that it's true. But there were foreign rulers of Egypt, the Hyksos. I, I'm not sure when these guys came, but there's so much historically here that could be true. It sounds far-fetched until you study the history of Egypt. And then you see that under one family of kings, Joseph was welcomed. And then that changed. And in the next family, the Israelites became slaves. And it's why they stayed ethnically separated. And it's why they'll grow to 2 million people from about 170. And it's how God brings them out of Egypt and into the promised land. It's an amazing plan. And you're in it. Could Abraham or Jacob or even Joseph foreseen these events when God said, I will make a nation of you? Abraham just obeyed. He did the one thing he could do. He could in no way see that his grandchildren and great-grandchildren would end up in Egypt as the most favored people. There's no way. Too far-fetched. Think of that when you ask God, show me your plans. You can't handle the truth. (laughs) But he's going to do it anyway. And I think the first seven eternities in heaven are just going to be our brains exploding with joy about what God did. Amen? I had a dream once, and my brain buzzed with joy. I just just got a taste of what it's going to be like to wake up in heaven. And I'm telling you, think about it. Heaven is going to be a giant Remember that when you suffer, and remember that when you're ordering your life. His ways come true, and they will always surprise you. Otherwise, you'd be God, and you're not, and I'm not. So be open. Be open to God's plan. Be open to that weird thing that comes into your life that doesn't make sense, but you try to look at it through God's lens. Be believing. Be God-focused. Be ready to see. Do you see God at work in the ups and downs of your life? One of the questions I've been asking is, do you have an experience of what someone else meant for evil, God turned for good? That's your testimony. Have you flipped the script? You flipped your life from, I got to get and I got to have and I got to do on this time continuum to, I'm being trained to become like Christ. The companion scripture to all of this, and here's where we'll end is Romans 8. Uh, You want to close your eyes, you want to keep them open, do whatever you want, but listen. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that's coming. The creation waits in eager expectations for the sons of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. This is, think of this. Our lives, even, even as we go down to the grave, is but a womb. It's childbirth. I think we're in a womb of consciousness consciousness and we're being we're becoming like Christ and we will be born into eternity amen when you die you're born Jesus said it to Martha don't you know that though the body dies it will live the light that's given us uh, Paul describes is that the hope we have in Christ is a light put in us it's spirit it's light we have clay jars remember when I broke that jar but the light is still there We focus on the jar. Live in the light. Verse 26 of Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't even know what to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words can't express. 
And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God will work for good. In the evil meant by others, God can work for good. Be seeing, be handing it over. Those who have been called according to his purpose. Some people see those evil things, they become bitter and they wrap it into their own evil and it's just evil. But even world events we need to see as as something God can use. Though evil men plan them. And though evil people cause pain and suffering. The believer refuses to think that's the final reality. The believer looks for what God is up to. What then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies, meaning makes right. Who is the one that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. There is nobody who knows this whole understanding better than Jesus. The way he lived his life was completely father-focused. Even so much that the people whipping him, beating him, and stabbing him, he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They have fallen for the shell. Father, forgive them. And it was a sincere wish. Why? Because heaven is that awesome. And he is the one who died more than that, who was raised to life. He's at the right hand of God interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Jesus who did that? Shall trouble? Again, think of that map, the down part, you're in the minus. Hardship? The loss of a daughter or a son? The loss of a marriage? The loss of a business? Shall that separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Today, people are seeing in a dream the man in white, and it doesn't matter what else is going on. They're saying, i got to find out more about this. And they're going to churches, and I pray there are churches and places and people with the word to help them see the next step. I believe in this country more often this is going to happen. You might have a neighbor who's going, are you ready to reach out to your neighbor with the hope you have? You tell them this story. Just read through Genesis with them. Open your Bible with a neighbor and just say, I think I know what you're talking about. Read Romans 7 and 8. No, and all these things were more than conquerors for him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, not angels nor demons, things present nor future, nor anything, anything in the, in the worldly clay-based time scale not height or depth, anything else in all creation, that's the universe, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus that is beyond the universe. And all God's people say, amen. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. I thank you that this story is our story, that you were at work in Joseph to save people in this room. I pray right now for that person who came in here not knowing this now knows it and something's stirring in their heart. And Father, all they have to do according to you in John 5 is believe. Hear my Father's word and believe has crossed over from death to life. They will not be condemned. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, John 3, that whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Right now, Father, I pray that person says, Jesus, I need you, I love you, and I get it. Rescue me. And to that person, I say, it's done. You can't be the same anymore. Live this new life. Open the word. Read the book of John. Read the book of Romans. On your own, the Holy Spirit will guide you. And Jesus will show up. Better than a dream in his word. Living and active. Able to separate all the gook. Able to bless like you don't know. Oh, Father, make it so. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.